Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Watch and Pray. I am your faithful brother from another mother, Chuck, and I, uh, I'm excited to have you guys here today. If you like what we do in these teachings, I would just ask that you would pound that like button and share the teachings with your friends and loved ones, especially in this day and age we live. Uh, we think the information is pertinent and we need to get that out. Make sure that you leave any comments, questions that you have, or any other video series that you would like us to tackle here. We'll go wherever you'd like. Uh, we are also adding a Facebook page this week where you can look at different articles and diff get different resources that we find uh, important here at Watch and Pray Ministries. And finally, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and we will have those addresses in the video description and on the screen. I look forward to getting into some deep stuff today, so I hope you're ready to go. We are in the Church of Laodicea. Our learning objectives for today are to continue to develop the historical prophetic interpretation of the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and we are going to discover the history of the age of Laodicea. So we're finally going to get to learn some history. Uh, as we always do, let's pray and get started. Father, we just uh, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we get to come before you and learn from you. We just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would guide us and teach us and lead us into all truth as we discover the truth is so important. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's get to rocking and rolling. We're looking here at what's called the prophetic application of these seven letters to the churches of Revelation chapters 2 and through, meaning did Jesus pick these seven churches out of the hundreds that there were uh, in existence at that time for a specific reason? Uh, only God could orchestrate something like this, by the way. When you look at all the different threads that had to weave together with the type of church, what their problems were, uh, all those different things going on, and Jesus somehow picked these seven, which represents the number of completion, by the way, perfectly, uh, and they laid out church history in advance. That's what we're examining. So we saw Ephesus, the apostolic age. That's when the birth of the church happens, and then unfortunately a lot of people fell into religion quickly. Uh, then after that comes Smyrna, which was the Roman persecution age, and of course that's when the church got persecuted. Pergamos corresponds with the age of Constantine, which ultimately uh, Constantine would enact all kinds of religious freedom for the Christian church, and ultimately the Christian church would marry the world at that time, and, and it would become the state church. Thyatira, we call that the Dark Ages. Unfortunately, the church gets completely corrupted by the world. In Sardis, we have the Reformation, which finally the church begins to take a baby step forward, and in all actuality, they were going backwards in that uh, they were getting back to some of the more simple things of faith, and that's what we got to get to is back to how it all started. Philadelphia is what the, it was the Great Awakening Age. We saw that the church preaches the gospel and watches for Jesus. By the way, that's our goal. Preach the gospel, tell people the good news of Jesus, and to watch for Jesus. Okay, so we're going to look at this. Is Are we living currently in the age of Laodicea? Remember that the name of the church is important. It comes from uh, Laodicea. Laos means people. Dicea is power uh, in Greek. So a lot of different combinations of words. People ruling, people power, people rights, people justice. Uh, all of those could come into play here. you got to remember every aspect of these letters is prophetic, and that's why Jesus picked them. So people power. So this church age is going to be very prophetic in lights of a lot of people are going to have rights. A lot of people are going to have freedom. A lot of people are going to be able to self-actualize that freedom. And also there's going to be a big time focus on social justice, which there's nothing wrong with social justice, but we'll explore today the best way to go about social justice. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Once again, don't forget, the name that Jesus uses, the title that Jesus uses for all seven of these letters, super important. He calls himself the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He is the, he's the truth. He is the faithful witness. He is the faithful martyr in Greek there. He died for our sins. That is going to be important. He is the beginning of the creation of God. A better translation would say he is the beginning of the creation. He is the creator of God. We know that everything was created by, for, through Jesus. So that's going to be really important. This lukewarm church is we're going to forget those things. Jesus continues. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Yum. 
Um, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Okay, that's the letter. We looked at that. So if this letter is historically prophetic, here's just really quick some points I like to I like to look at what we should expect if the if the letter is prophetic this is what we should expect in the day we live in uh, the history the church will lose sight of some very fundamental truths of Jesus this time period will not obey Jesus especially his great commission of going out and telling others about Jesus the Jesus of the Bible is not present in this church movement at all he may not even be welcome in a lot of these churches Jesus wouldn't be invited to many Christian congregations during this period this will be a very prosperous time physically, but not spiritually. This church age will be spiritually prideful, apathetic, and self-deceived. Not a good combination. This time period will be lacking works through Jesus, His righteousness, His Holy Spirit vision. There will need to be an individual focus on Jesus alone and not an external idea or movement, etc. We also looked at if this was Laodicean uh, age, right before the rapture of the church, we are also living in the end of the church age. And we have some, some verses that we looked at last week that we could expect if we are living in those end times. There will be a departure from the fundamentals of faith. It will be dangerous times due to the carnality and the selfishness of man. The visible church will look and act godly, but will deny God's power. Men will openly scoff Jesus in his return, and the world will generally be business as usual. So, we looked at last week where we were at. What I did was I wanted to show you exactly where we were. Uh, I'm calling this the State of the Union Laodicea 2020. So we looked at a lot of stats, where we are as a church. Uh, approximately 70% of the w people of the West, West, okay, America, Europe, uh, that's the visible church of Christ, okay? That's the visible church that takes the name of Jesus. If the world thinks of what is a what is a Christian, they think, you know, Roman Catholic, American Christian. That's kind of what's in view there, the visible church. Now, unfortunately, 70% of the people of the West claim to be Christians, but most aren't truly born again. They have never really actually trusted Jesus. Uh, it's It's a sad state. We looked at all that last week. They have become a name-only church. So once again, they're Christians by name, but technically they've never really trusted Jesus. They've never set, uh, accepted his uh, covering, his salvation. They, so they are a name-only church. Now what's interesting, some theologians have taken the analogy, Jesus says you are neither cold nor hot. Some theologians have, have noticed that the analogy, if you're cold, that means you're completely turned off to Jesus and you're completely not open to things of the Bible. Uh, versus hot, you're on fire for Jesus, and you are uh, all about the, the Word of God, right? Lukewarm would kind of be in the middle. You kind of claim a little bit of this, yeah, uh, Jesus, you probably really aren't fully trusting Him. You haven't really saved Him. Uh, is that what in, what's in view with it being a lukewarm church? Is this kind of in the middle, this name-only Christianity? Maybe. Uh, Europe is basically a post-Christian nation culturally, and America isn't far between. They don't pray, they don't go to church, they don't read their Bible. You know, those are all seen as things of the past. They're spiritual, but not religious, right? A majority of the visible church don't understand or hold to the basic fundamentals of true Christian doctrine. We looked at this last week. A, a scary amount of people don't understand that all you have to do to be saved is trust Jesus. That's faith alone. And all you need for spiritual life is found in God's Word. A majority of the visible church believe you need Jesus plus something for salvation. They believe you need works. A majority of the visible church don't understand the miracle of God's Word. Uh, we looked at a stat last week. One out of ten Christians read their Bible. When if you actually research this out, eight out of ten American households have a, a Bible. We have the, once again, we're prosperous, we have everything that we need, but we're just too busy and too prideful to take hold of what we need. Half of the West, Western church don't understand that sin was dealt with at the cross. They believe in different forms of purgatory. More and more of the visible church are unable to see moral decay passing as progress. We continue to look at all these advancements in, in the world, and some of them are really bad, and we think that that's a movement of God. We have to get back to God's Word to know what is decay versus what is progress. 
Okay, a vast majority of the visible church are not fulfilling the Great Commission. We looked at a couple stats last week. Most of the church don't even know what the Great Commission is. They don't even know their purpose. And once again, Jesus said he wanted the drink to be hot or cold, don't matter, as long as he's having a satisfying drink. So in order to be satisfactory to Jesus, you have to fulfill your purpose. How do you fulfill your purpose? You fulfill the Great Commission. You love and you tell people about Jesus. Uh, so just from those points alone that we looked at last week, we could deduce that the church is lukewarm, right? And Jesus says he will vomit them out of his mouth. I didn't even tell you guys the craziest part yet, okay? Young people are the greatest majority of those departing from the faith. How crazy is that, guys? Uh, the number one source of apostasy is young kids. Why, how, why are the kids leaving the faith at such an astronomical rate? I have a few theories. One is kids, I don't know if you know this, but... Kids, they have a pretty good uh, bullcrap meter, right? Like they can tell when you're faking the funk. Uh, if you're not, if you're taking the name of Jesus and you're not really living it and you're telling them to do this, do that, but you're not living that life and you're not really getting in God's word, of course they're going to realize that this whole Jesus movement is hypocritical, right? And they're going to question that. And by the way, questions. Kids have questions today. They have questions about science, the world, culture. And so many of us are just too busy to be in God's word and to do the homework that w would lead the kids to the right thinking. Okay. So once again, state of the union, where are we at? We're not in a good spot, guys. Here, this uh, hit my email this week uh, from Josh McDowell Ministry. 70% of teens say anxiety and depression are major problems amongst their peers. Seven out of 10 Christians, anxiety and depression. Okay. We're getting more anxious and more depressed uh, as we go along for our kids. How can that be? Okay, Those ages 16 to 24, 63 times more lonely. So we live in this information age and kids are more lonely now than older adults are. Okay, So how can we be so hyper-connected yet uh, lonely? Only 4% of Generation Z hold to a biblical worldview. 76% of men and women ages 18 to 24 regularly seek out porn. So once again, we've taken God out of all out of the mix. When you don't have God, you begin to fill uh, fill the image of God with other things, with idols. And sex is a big one, especially for the young generation, because we're bombarded with sex. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people. So once again, why are kids leaving the faith? Why are they so depressed? The beauty is, over the next couple weeks here, I'm going to expose to you how we became this lukewarm church of Laodicea. And thankfully, if you're struggling with any of this stuff, and if your kids are struggling with any of this stuff, we can learn how to fight back. Okay, I, I will show you how and why uh, we've gotten where we are. And that's, that's going to be exciting as we move forward. Uh, continuing on with the State of the Union, sadly, most within the visible church are ignorant and apathetic when it comes to true biblical theology and practice. Don't know, don't care. Chuck Misler always used to say that. Go ask a, an average American on the street about deep things of theology and where they're going to go and uh, all of the, the deeper things of, of theology, and most will say, don't know, don't care. I'm a Christian, <laughs> right? It's, it's, they're ignorant and they're apathetic. We've become so bombarded with all this stuff that we don't focus on things that matter. We can tell you all the stats you need to know about basketball, football, baseball, uh, or what soap operas, uh, what's going on in the latest soap operas, but we can't tell our kids the important doctrines in the Bible. Don't know, don't care. Personal freedoms, technology, and material possessions have kept this visible church from acknowledging a need. Once again, we have all this stuff. How do you acknowledge that you need something when you have all this stuff? Okay. So that's where we're at. We're not in a good spot. Now, the million dollar question, this is where I left you last week, is how did we get here? We have to figure out how we got here and what we can do to fight our way out of it or to get out of it as a, as a church. You have your uh, chance to fight back against Laodicea. Trust me, uh, you can and you can teach proper doctrine and we're going to explore all that. So how did we get here? Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at 150 years of the most fascinating time in history. You guys will see that. You know what I'm talking about. We're talking wars. We're talking uh, intellectual advancements, all kinds of stuff. We're going to look at it all. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time here the next couple of weeks looking at Laodicea. So we look at this picture here, historically prophetic. Is Laodicea, the time from 1900 up until today, is that... Uh, is that a picture of the church of where we're at today? Now, once again, we don't know exactly when this lukewarm church age begun. So I'm going to take you through a little, 
uh, a little section here I call Fruchtenbaum's Speculation. Okay, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he has this quote coming up. Now, originally, just so you guys know, I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but the more I dug into the story, the more enthralled I became, and the more I realized this is a great picture of how we got where we're at and what we can do moving forward. So just so you guys know, this was extremely fascinating for me and it was extremely fun for me to dig into. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I hope I can make it interesting for you guys. So here's what Fruchtenbaum says about the beginning of the church age of Laodicea. If this present age of apostasy had a definite beginning, and this is impossible to determine for the United States, it might well have been January 20th, 1891. On that day, a man named Charles Augustus Briggs gave his inaugural address at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Okay, so we are going to break this down. Charles Augustus. I hope he doesn't mind if I call him Chuck. Uh, but me and Chuck, we got some talks. We got some talks to have. So January 20th, 1891, Charles Augustus Briggs, he gives his inaugural address at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Just so you guys know... Uh, Union Theological Seminary, that's like, that's a seminary where you train future pastors, right? Like you, you go to seminary to become a pastor, and those pastors would go through the pulpits of America. So this was a Presbyterian seminary training facility, okay? Now, before I tell you uh, what he said, let me set up exactly uh, what happens at this scene. This is, I, I got to paint a picture for you because this was dramatic. This was breathtaking. This was radical. In so many senses, it was heartbreaking also. I'm sure when many were sitting there listening to Chuck talk, uh, they sat there with their jaws open and, their, and, they, uh, and, and they were just in disbelief as to what they were watching unfold. Uh, so let me paint a picture as to what happened this day. So Chuck had literally just been promoted to a new position of amazingly high authority within the seminary. Like literally, as he was getting ready to give his inaugural address, he was given uh, this new leadership role. It was called the Edward Robinson Chair of Biblical Theology. Uh, and it was named after one of his past mentors and teachers. But he literally just got a promotion, and he had to take us. He had to swear to an oath as he took this position. Check out this uh, this oath here. Uh, the president uh, address on behalf of the board of directors and in accordance with the Constitution of the Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. I call upon you to make and subscribe the declaration required of each member of the faculty of this institution. Thereupon, Professor Briggs made the declaration as follows. I believe the scriptures of the Old New Testament to, the, to be the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And I do now, in the presence of God and the directors of this seminary, solemnly and sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures. I do also in like manner approve of the Presbyterian form of government, and I do solemnly promise that I will not teach or inculcate anything which shall appear to me to be subversive of the said system of doctrines and of the principles of said form of government so long as I shall continue to be a professor in the seminary." Thereupon, President Butler said, In the name of the Board of Directors, I declare that Professor Charles A. Briggs is inaugurated as the incumbent of the Edward Robinson Chair of Biblical Theology. So he just got this promotion. He just said this oath. I, I imagine they maybe made him raise his hand and put a hand on, his, on the Bible. I mean, this was a big deal. Uh, then the ceremony kept going, and Chuck was introduced uh, by his one of his classmates, actually, his, the, his classmate's name was David R. Frazier. So not only did he kind of give a congratulations, but he gave him kind of an exhortation, kind of a good job now, this is what I want you to do to lead the people. So listen to how David concludes this exhortation. He says, the design of revelation, and he's talking about the divine revelation, the divine revelation found in the Bible, is summed up essentially in the Johannian or statement from John, these things are written that you may might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. As all roads lead to Rome, so all scriptures lead to Christ. I loved that. I highlighted that. All roads led to Rome. Uh, and that was prophetic. 
but all scripture. When you're studying the Bible, it all leads to Jesus. Jesus is the focal picture, the full manifestation of the Bible. It's important to remember. He, can, he continues, The final end and ultimate design of the Holy Scriptures are to make wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Hence, it is your business, my dear brother, from the word written to educe or to bring out the word incarnate. And I beg you to so present Jesus Christ to all who come to you for instruction, that they may go from your classroom to their great life work, not only impressed with an abiding sense of the matchless beauty and the mighty power of that divine Savior concerning whom the scriptures so abundantly testify, but also, and as the normal outcome of your teachings with a fixed determination, to know nothing among men save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he's just building up Briggs here. And it, you can, this is a perfect uh, thing to say to a future professor, right? I just pray that you would bring these kids in their lessons to to Jesus and to his understanding. All roads lead to Jesus. He concludes here, and as you thus teach the word of God under the guidance of the spirit of God, as day by day you present the truth as it is in Jesus to those who are to preach a crucified redeemer to dying men, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he equip you for duty, help you in the discharge of it. And when your great work is finished, may his well done be pronounced upon his good and faithful servant. So that's how he concluded. And then he uh, probably went down and, and the crowd probably waited as they saw Dr. Charles walk up. So now we'll see with what Charles, which, what direction is Charles going to take this new seminary? Will Jesus be able to look back on Charles's life uh, and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Okay, so now remember, he had sworn the oath. His classmate just got up and exhorted him to lead people to the true word of God and to Jesus. I imagine all the audience, there's hush over the crowd, and they're just staring up at Charles to see what he would have to say. Now, of course, I don't have time to go over the entire uh, discourse. Uh, I, I literally, I read the whole thing. I couldn't stop reading. It was 111 pages. I read the entire thing. It was fascinating. It's, uh, he wrote an entire book on it, uh, The Authority of Holy Scripture by Charles Briggs. I'll show you a screenshot of it where he pu uh, publicized this inaugural address. Now, I just picked some of my favorites to read to you guys so you can see where he went. Okay, So the stage is set. Charles Briggs, new professor, stands up and he's going to teach on where he is going to go. Are you guys excited? Have I built this up good enough for you? Is this going to lead into the age of Laodicea? Let's see what Dr. Charles said. One of the things Dr. Charles said was, But the Bible has no magical virtue in it, and there is no halo in closing it. It will not stop a bullet any better than a mass book. It will not keep off evil spirits any better than a cross. It will not guard a home from fire half so well as holy water. Uh, at least we know Chuck's got jokes. That, that's a little funny there. I'll give, I'll give him a little bit of props. If you desire to know when and how you should take a journey, you will find a safer guide in an almanac or a daily newspaper. The Bible is no better than hydromancy or witchcraft if we seek for divine guidance by the chance opening of the book. Yikes. I don't know about you guys, but I'm offended. I hope you're offended a little bit. Uh, how many times have you guys over the course of your life been like, man, God, I need you, uh, and just randomly open the Bible uh, to wherever it would lead just to get a good word from the Lord? I, that's happened to me often. So to hear somebody say something like this, that that's, uh, that that's like witchcraft, that, that's kind of uh, harsh. Okay, now just so you guys know, I get what he's doing here. What he's doing is he's basically saying the hard Bible, like the physical Bible that you hold in your hand, it doesn't really do anything. And I, I understand what he's doing. He's basically trying to illustrate that the physical Bible doesn't do anything. But it's, it's the point, and you could make the point that, of course, the Bible itself doesn't have power, but it is the word of the Bible, and it is the word that's leading to Jesus. I get it, but if you guys look at the context of everything that he's doing in his speech, he is now going to begin to uh, kind of demystify the Bible and make the Bible seem to be just a, another written work of man and that divine revelation is, is really found in us. Okay, so he's going to devalue the Bible and that's how it all begins. 
I shall venture to affirm that so far as I can see, there are errors in the scriptures that no one has been able to explain away. And the theory that they were not in the original text is sheer assumption upon which no mind can rest with certainty. So, uh-oh, errors in the text. Now, just so you guys know, I don't have time to go into details. We'll talk about errors in the text later. Are there really errors? Not in the originals, but we'll talk about that. This isn't an apologetics course today. I just want to give you a flavor of where he's going. Another barrier to the Bible has been the interpretation put upon predictive prophecy, making it a sort of history before the time and looking anxiously for the fulfillment of the details of biblical prediction. Cunin has shown that if we insist upon the fulfillment of the details of the predictive prophecy of the Old Testament, many of those predictions have been reversed by history, and the great body of the Messianic prediction has not only never been fulfilled, but cannot now be fulfilled for the reason that its own time has passed forever. Yikes. So a lot of people, when they study the Bible and they look at it critically, they don't believe in what's called predictive prophecy. And we'll talk a lot more about predictive prophecy in the future, but just so you guys know, predictive prophecy means that God writes it and it comes to pass later. That's how we know that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So it's a big deal that he's devaluing things like this. He continues, we have undermined the breastworks of traditionalism. Let us blow them to atoms. We have forced our way through the obstructions. Let us remove them from the face of the earth, that no man hereafter may be kept from the Bible, but that all may freely enter in, search it through and through, and find God enthroned in its very center. So he had just laid out all these uh, points as to why the Bible is being kind of... Uh, held over everyone okay so he calls this traditionalism if you hold the fundamentals of faith that's traditionalism okay and he says he's broken that apart let's blow it to atoms so that no one is kept from the bible all may freely enter in so you anyone can read now read the bible according to charles and basically you can make it say whatever you want okay don't worry about the sin don't worry about any of those other uh, other things in the bible everyone is now welcome to the Bible, okay? The self-constituted defenders can no longer retain a monopoly of the Word of God and exact conditions of all who would use it. It has already been taken from them by biblical criticism and is open to all mankind without conditions. Okay, now he brings up a key word here, biblical criticism. Don't think that just because it says criticism, just you know, biblical criticism is basically a form of education. It's basically, it's how you look at the Bible and interpret its deeper things. We'll talk more about biblical criticism. I, I want you to see that. But uh, biblical criticism is an attempt to kind of understand the text uh, and dive deeper into the text. That's called biblical criticism. So now he's saying, basically, everyone who's held to the word of God as this authoritative source, it's all been blown up. Okay, due to biblical criticism, and now man can come to it. Okay, so once again, he's devalued the Bible. Progressive sanctification after death is the doctrine of the Bible and the church, and it is of vast importance in our times that we should understand it and live in accordance with it. The biblical redemption is a redemption of our race and of a universal nature. The Bible teaches that the material universe shares in the destiny of man and is in the throes of birth for this blessed hope. Okay, so... Once again, don't got super lot, long time here to go into to the deep things of doctrine, but basically what he's saying is, once again, after man dies, he still has to be sanctified, okay? Learning his sin nature, sanctification, understanding more of God isn't over, okay? Uh, and what he's going at is he's basically going to go in a roundabout way to say that all men when they die, will still have a chance to get to God. Basically, he wasn't fully a universalist, but he basically teaches that after death, man will continue to be sanctified and will still have opportunities to learn and uh, come under the umbrella of, of faith in God. Now, man, I wish that was true. I really do wish that that was true. But unfortunately, in the Bible, I don't see anywhere in there second chances. And we'll talk more about proper doctrine later. But just so you guys know, this idea of, of the of progressive sanctification after death. So anyone can still find God after death uh, in this age. That's a big, big pitfall because once again, God has revealed his son, Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins uh, and he made that payment. That's it, that your sin is done. There is no sanctification after. Now you choose today whether you accept that or not. But anyway, we gotta continue to move on here. Let the light shine higher and higher, the clear, bright light of the day. Truth fears no light. Light chases error away. 
True orthodoxy seeks the full blaze of the noontide, noontide sun. In the light of such a day, the unity of Christendom will be gained. Once again, new, uh, kind of new age thinking is that we're going to continue to progress to this age of enlightenment and that man will eventually throw aside all religious dogmas and all will be unified in Christendom, right? You'll hear a lot about unity, but you'll hear a lot about unity outside of what's been revealed in in the Bible, right? Like, just so you guys know, there is no unity outside of faith in Jesus Christ. There is no unity outside of being in Christ. We'll talk more about that, okay? Finally, he concluded, criticism is at work with knife and fire. Let us cut down everything that is dead and harmful, every kind of dead orthodoxy, every species of effet ecclesiastic, ecclesiasticism, all those dry and brittle fences that constitute that constitution denominationalism and are the that, I'm sorry that constitute denominationalism and are the barriers of church unity let us remove every encumbrance out of the way for a new life the life of god is moving throughout christendom and the springtime of a new age is about to come upon us so once again those who hold to kind of this idea that uh, the old way of thinking about the bible is closed-minded and intolerant, they're going to continue to talk about this new age upon us where we will all uh, basically sing kumbaya. So Charles Augustus Briggs. Wow, wow, wow. Come on, Chuck. He stated many of these things. These were stated publicly for the first time. Once again, you got to understand, this is why Fruchtenbaum says this is when the apostasy began. This happened in public. This was a, an, an inauguration on behalf of a seminary big deal. And he basically said there's now three great foundations of truth, the Bible, church, and reason or your mind. So basically he was saying the Bible is kind of Protestants who hold to the Bible. He called the church basically the visible church like Roman Catholicism. That was the church. And uh, the reason is anyone, any mind, any thinking man, anyone, doesn't matter what you what your belief, you can come to God uh, without having to come to Jesus in the Bible big deal, right? That's a big, big, big deal. He questioned all kinds of uh, things in the Bible and the error in the scriptures. He questioned predictive prophecy. Uh, all of this apostasy had officially crept into the church. Now, once again, how did Chuck get to this point? Okay, that's the million dollar question. He was the son of a, a successful barrel maker. He got saved during a series of revivals that took place in 1857 and 1858. Uh, while he was pursuing theological studies, he attended Union Theological Seminary before traveling to Germany. Now, here's where things get interesting. He went to Germany where he eagerly embraced Historicimus, who taught a new critical way of thinking about history and studying the Bible. I want you guys to know something. I don't quite understand what's going on. There is some crazy stuff going on in Germany throughout this time. Uh, Germany is the seed of a lot of evil and a lot of bad stuff. Where this biblical criticism really gets its birth is in Germany. And once again, very interesting to think about. Uh, the altar of Zeus that we talked about that was in Pergamum, they actually made a, a replica of it in Berlin. And uh, even Hitler, when he preached from the stage, they had his stage redone as the altar of Zeus, which has correlations with Satan. Just throwing that out there for you. I don't know, but long story short, you go to seminary teaching in, or theology school in Germany, you come out of that place corrupted, okay? Uh, lots of corruptions happened in Germany. This higher education, biblical criticism. So, what ended up happening? Well, Briggs was put on trial multiple times by the Presbyterian Church. And finally, in 1893, he was suspended by the Presbyterian Church. But don't worry, uh, he was picked up by another denomination, the Episcopalian denomination. And the Union Theological Seminary actually withdrew from the Presbyterian denomination. So you can totally tell that they took the side of Charles Briggs and they were excited with the direction that Charles would take versus the traditional Presbyterian route. Uh, but they withdrew Presbyterian uh, denomination and they became independent from that time. Uh, as an Episcopalian, Charles Briggs went on, he stayed controversial and he, he continued to focus on ecumenism and worldwide unity and cooperation and bringing in the world together under this new thinking uh, of, of Christ. He actually, he passed away in 1913. So that's Charles. And I, once again, 
I hope I didn't over uh, dramatize that for you, but that was the event and that story fascinated me because it sums up so much of this Laodicean age and some of the key terms and themes that are present during there. You have corruption in the big city seminaries, you have doctrine and how it applies and how it plays out in the real world. You have the war versus the old Bible thumper, traditionalist versus new age, kind of the Bible is, is growing and changing, dogma versus self-realization, science versus tradition. You have betrayal, you have biblical criticism, you have this idea and focus of unity and ecumenism and this new fresh age okay all of it kind of came together here and it was a really great introduction to the age of laodicea and i think it sums up the age really really well so i thank arnold fruchtenbaum uh, for leading me to that as the start of the age of apostasy uh, Fruchtenbaum concludes, Briggs was not the first modernist. They, uh, modernist is a term for kind of someone who sees the Bible evolving and we need to uh, change the, the Bible with the culture, a modernist. Okay. But his, so Briggs was not the first modernist, but his address was the first public affirmation of modernism in a theological seminary in the United States. Although the Union Theological Seminary became independent, they still continued to train ministers for the Presbyterian Church and for their pulpits. This set the stage for the way the apostasy would develop in the course of the 20th century. Apostasy would first begin in a denominational school and thus affect the training of ministers who were to fulfill their pulpits. Do you guys see how that works? If you can infiltrate the seminaries, then you can infiltrate all the churches. Okay, and by the way, this is one of the reasons why I want to go into seminary. I want to go on the front line. I want to I want to be on this front line. That's that's if I had a dream job, seminary professor. Pray about that. See if some some day there's a way I can do that. Now, I couldn't help myself. Uh, I'm going to meddle a little bit, as Pastor Block likes to say. I wanted to see what had come of this seminary, the Union Theological Seminary. I wanted to see where they're at today. You guys know me. I like to party. I'll go where the controversy is. I'm not afraid. Uh, and I came upon their website. And here we go. We're going to look through this real quick. Uh, the, the Union Theological Seminary. And some of the things that I found. A heart of open space encircled by magnificent building, buildings, that's union. We are a school where nothing less than God is the subject of our study and where the care of the world is our calling. We are Christian, ecumenical, interreligious, world engaged, broad in thought, and welcoming to all who venture in. We are gracious, open, hospitable, and safe. And our campus is a space waiting to be filled by those who choose to wander here. We are at once a place of learning and lightness, gravitas, and grace. Mm -mm -mm. So they, you see clearly there, they've claimed Christianity, right? We are a Christian, ecumenical, interreligious group. So once again, Charles Briggs, his theology paid off there. So we're left to dig deeper into their website here to figure out which God uh, they claim uh, is the subject of their study. Once again, this isn't a fun thing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm just here to party. Why come to Union? Union's campus is where faith and scholarship meet to reimagine the work of justice. Its customized curriculum, award-winning faculty, and urban setting provide an unparalleled atmosphere. Click to hear why others chose to enroll. Okay, did you hear that? Reimagine the work of justice. So I was left wondering, is this a school of law or theology, right? Like this is a Christian school and their big tenant is justice, right? We're going to hear a lot about justice and social justice as we move through this church age. Now, once again, is God a God of justice? Absolutely. Is our God about justice? Absolutely. Should we seek causes of justice? Absolutely. Okay. Are we all going to see justice in our lifetimes? Not necessarily, okay? Now, here's the good news about being a Christian. We aren't guaranteed justice yet, but we are guaranteed from the Scripture that God is a God of justice who will right all wrongs, period. Okay, so whether we're on the front cutting edge of this justice or not is irrelevant because we trust God is a God of justice and He will right all wrongs, okay? Is the church's main focus justice? No, okay? What is the church's main focus? Jesus, okay? We live right now in what's called the age of grace. It's, a, it's the gospel age, right? Unfortunately, you, you kind of forgive injustices. Now, once again, I'm not saying don't focus on them and don't enact 
policies and vote for people that are going to get the policies that you want. I'm all for all that. Even get fight for some some justice causes. I'm all for that. But just so you guys know, as Christians, we live in this age of grace where you forgive those who wrong you. You forgive those who are who who aren't providing justice for you. We just live in this age. It's this crazy pause in God's plan where all you do, you pray for your enemies and you tell them about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and it's all about the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be focusing on, not just justice. Okay, continuing on. What makes union unique? Today, the seminary lives out this formative call to service by training people of all faiths and none who are called to the work of social justice in the world. I don't quite know what that means. They're calling people of all faiths. So once again, this is a Christian seminary. They don't care if you're Muslim, Buddhist, New Age, atheist, don't care. They're going to teach you about social justice. Okay, and this is a seminary, a Christian seminary. Continuing on, with roots that are firmly planted in the Protestant tradition, Union actively reforms itself in response to the changing needs of the world and evolving understanding of what it means to be faithful. That's the key there, guys, you got to understand. Uh, they believe that the world is evolving and that God is going to evolve, okay? So once again, some questions. Does Jesus want us training all faiths about social justice? I don't think so. They may have roots in Protestantism, but they're definitely not a, not planted in the basic fundamental roots of what Protestantism was and said. They believe they have to evolve with the culture and the world, and yikes, that's a slippery slope. How much of the world do we let in? Just so you guys know, I don't have the answer to that, but how much of the world do we let in versus how much do we keep out? That's the that's the million dollar question for the Christian church. It says we're not of the world, uh, but we're in it, right? So how much do we let this world dictate uh, dictate our, our thoughts, our move, our movements, our actions, etc.? It's a, That's a slippery slope. But anyways, does God change with culture? Absolutely not. Does God's word change with culture? Absolutely not. So uh, there's a lot of problems there. Mission. Their progressive theology has taken long taken shape at Union, where faith and scholarship meet to reimagine the work of justice. Once again, justice. Grounded in the Christian tradition and responsive to the needs of God's creation, a union education prepares its students for committed lives of service to the church, academy, and society. A union of education develops practices of mind and body that foster intellectual and academic excellence, social justice, and compassionate wisdom. Union forms courageous faith leaders who make a difference wherever they serve. Their vision... Education at Union Theological Seminary is deeply rooted in critical understanding of the breadth of Christian traditions, yet significantly instructed by the insights of, the, of other faiths. It makes connections between those traditions and the most profoundly challenging issues of our contemporary experience, the realities of suffering and injustice, world religious pluralism, the fragility of our planet, and discoveries of modern science. Once again, there's your big issues for those who believe we're, uh, we have to evolve with with this changing world. What are the big deals? It's uh, injustice, world religious pluralism, all the religions need to come together, the fragility of the planet. Once again, we'll talk about the fragility. We'll talk about planet, global. Should a Christian be supportive of taking care of the planet? Absolutely. But is that more important than leading others to Jesus? Never. Okay. Union envisions a future in which teaching and learning continues to be ecumenical in spirit and supporting a record academic, academic excellence and a deep commitment to social justice. Union envisions its graduates changing the world by practicing their vocations with the dedication that brings a religiously grounded, critical, and compassionate presence to the major personal, social, political, and scientific realities of our time. Wow, are you catching a theme here? Uh, and once again, we're going to continue to hear a lot about science and culture. Here is a, a list of some of the some of the activities and some of the different programs that the, that the Christian seminary offers. Uh, the program for engaged Buddhism, Islam, social justice, and interreligious en engagement, the Center for Community Engagement and Social Justice, and finally, Center for Earth Ethics. All very interesting. Finally, notice there and there about uh, their, their um, seal. I brought it up for you here. Uh, the theological seal. Uh, they have unitus, veritas, and, and carita, caritas, which is uh, Latin, and it stands unity, truth, and love. And just so you guys know, once again, this kind of new progressive church offers unity, truth, and love, and unfortunately, they are devoid of all three, right? Unity. Just so you guys know, I, I hate to be so intolerant, uh, but 
there is no unity of Jesus with the devil. Okay, there is no unity of a Christian with someone who hasn't been born again. Now, does that mean that we look down on them? No, it just means that there is no true unity uh, of a person who hasn't trusted Christ yet. Good news, I still love them, and, but here's what I got to do. I got to tell them about Jesus. That is love, right? So once again, truth. Do they have truth? Absolutely not. Most you'll see as we progress in this lukewarm church, they don't even believe in absolute truths. All truth is kind of progressing and evolving. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Bible says that. So that's truth, right? And love. Do they really have love? That, once again, absolutely not. Okay. If I saw you running as fast as you could, and I know that you're running and there's a big pitfall ahead that's going to lead ultimately to your death. Would it be loving of me to just let you keep running? No. What would be loving would be me, A, try to catch up to you, grab you, throw you down, stop you, or yell, hey, there's a massive cliff coming, right? So just so you guys know, that's true love, is to warn others that if they don't figure out Jesus, they're headed over the cliff. That's true love, okay? Okay. So you know what's interesting while I was digging around the website and where they are today? What's interesting is what's missing from the website, okay? I found no doctrinal statements of faith, none. Like this is what we believe, these are the creeds we hold to, none. And once again, we should expect that because progressive theology is all about, it's all changing, right? The absolutes are changing. There's no doctrinal statements of faith. Believe what you want. As long as you're a good person, We'll all figure this out. As long as you fight for justice, we'll all figure this out, right? You know what else was missing from the website? Website, And just so you guys know, you can go play around. You know what was massively missing? Jesus. I didn't find the name of Jesus in any core area of the website. And this is a Christian seminary that teaches theology students, right? Never saw Jesus, never saw salvation, never saw sin. And once again, extremely indicative of the age in which we live in. Would Jesus even be welcome at Union Theological Seminary? Don't know. I went through months of tweets from Union Theological Seminary. That's what I like to do. I like to party. Once again, I saw hundreds of tweets on social justice, poverty, re other religions, minorities, gender issues, sexual identity issues, all of it. But guess what I didn't see? Jesus. Okay, so once again, are you seeing the big theme there? Justice without Jesus? You can't have justice without Jesus. Needless to say, that was a fateful day in 1891, and Chuck's actions, that inaugural address, have had severe repercussions. I imagine uh, what would have changed, what would be different if he would have held true to the Word of God? What would we see down there in New York City at Union Theological Seminary? How different would that website be today? That just shows you how important doctrine is and taking a stand for God. One last little interesting tidbit here. Uh, as I was studying this, I came across another interesting thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had actually visited Union Theological Seminary. If you've never studied Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I highly recommend you do it. Uh, read his book, The Cost of Discipleship. It'll make you feel like crap. It'll make you feel like you need to be doing a lot more for the kingdom. Fascinating read. But this dude was a beast. He ended up actually dying uh, trying to take out Hitler. Yeah, he was, a, he was a beast. But anyway, he had actually taught and he had visited Union Theological Seminary. And this is what he had to say. Uh, I'm going to quote here from a book. Bonhoeffer prepared a written report of his year at Union for the Church Federation office in Germany. He pulled no punches when he writes, The theological spirit at Union Theological Seminary is accelerating the process of secularization of Christianity in America. He continues, A seminary in which numerous students openly laugh during a public lecture because they find it amusing when a passage on sin and forgiveness from Luther's On the Bondage of the Will is cited has obviously, despite its many advantages, forgotten what Christian ideology in its very essence stands for. He later adds, In a discussion before numerous students, one of the leading professors at Union Theological Seminary confessed to me amid the applause of the students that justification by faith was not only unimportant, but also a matter of indifference to him. Wow, wow. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 
amazing man after God. He basically, this was right before he goes back and he actually dies, uh, but he, he couldn't believe how far the American church had gone in these seminaries. It, he writes about it over and over again. He couldn't believe that a, a seminary professor confessed the justification by faith. That means you're justified, you're deemed not guilty when you trust Jesus. Wasn't even a big deal to that seminary, and it broke his heart, okay? But any, anyway, I found that fascinating, uh, in, interesting little tidbit. So that ends Fruchtenbaum's speculation as to when this church age began. So there you go. 1891, Charles Briggs. Interesting. 1891 backwards is 1981. It's me, Charles. Is there something there? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I like to party. I, there's signs there. So uh, 1891, apostasy. Charles Abley, born 1981, reverses apostasy. Boom. Uh, but anyway, so what's really cool, I'm going to end today, but just so you guys know, over the, coursing, uh, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to look at three big cultural shocks that hit during this time of apostasy, basically the 1900s up until today. Three big cultural shocks that bring about this age of Laodicea. And you just learned the first one, biblical criticism. And I'll talk more about what biblical criticism is uh, next week, okay? So I really hope that you guys see doctrine matters. I really hope that you understand where we're at as a church, and I really hope that you understand that we got we to gotta do some things here moving forward, uh, and that's going to be my prayer. So let's pray and get out of here. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this word. We thank you for history. We thank you for the stories that we get to relive and look at. God, I just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would help us draw even more closely to you and to your most holy word and to salvation through your Son in these days, weeks, months ahead because it means life and death to a dying world. I just pray that you would empower us to your great mission, and that is leading others into a loving relationship through your Son. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peace out.